Today's message is something pretty simple, and I don't think it's going to be really new. It's more of a reminder. Um, it's about reading the Word. And so it's really an exhortation to prepare for things to come. I think in the last, I don't know, it was about five years, there's been this word prepare consistently, consistently prepare, prepare, prepare. And so I think we're all kind of knowing that. But sometimes we need these reminders of how to prepare or um, just sometimes we fall away from things that are good to do for whatever reason. So I'm hoping this will inspire those people who are already in the Word just to continue doing so. For those who have maybe fallen away from that good habit, to, to take it up again. And for those who have never read through the Bible, I'm hoping this will sort of encourage you to take up the Word of God and to start reading it regularly, consistently. And the Lord, he, and if you can't, if you're not good at reading, you can always listen to it. There's lots of things online where you can just listen to the word. And the Lord really, he does encourage us in this. And, and there's a reward for this. And I want to take you to Psalm 1, 1 to 3. And I think we're again familiar with this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, his instructions, his word. And on his law, the Lord's law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Okay, now we know meditate is to ponder and to study. But first of all, what are you going to ponder and study? And you have to know the word. So it's about reading and being engaged. And there's a reward for that. Okay? Now we also read something similar. I think you're familiar with this scripture too. In Joshua 1.8. Um, this is to Joshua. It says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Again, we see that meditating on the word, that means reading and pondering, leads to reward. But it also should result in appropriate action. Okay, it's about obedience as well. What you read, get into your heart, and you have to walk it out. So the reward of good success comes after reading, understanding, and acting, okay? And then you will have good success. Then you will make your way prosperous. Okay, that's when you have to open up the scriptures to see what it really says. And there's a lot of other supporting scriptures to this, particularly in Deuteronomy and in Psalms and, and other places that support reading the word and understanding it. And so we can safely say that the Lord really does want us to read his word, right? So we can understand it. So we can do it because he wants to bless us. He wants us to prosper in his kingdom. His desire is for us. Now we know he's bigger than his word, right? He can't be put into any box. But this is the book that he chose to give us. This is what he chose to reveal to us. Okay? This is his word. He's the living word. So I think it's pretty important, don't you? It's important to know it, because in it, he reveals his plans. He shows what he did in the past, what he's going to do in the future. He shows his ways. He gives us instruction. He gives us the desires of his heart for us. And all through this, he reveals himself, his character, his identity. So this is a really important book. So I suggest that reading it is really important to getting to know him, okay? This is just a logical thing. He's the living word. He says, apart from him, we can do nothing. So it's impossible to prosper in the way we should go without knowing this, without getting into the word. And this prospering, it's all aspects of our lives. Sometimes you think, oh, it's maybe in our career. Maybe it's in our finances. But it includes walking in righteousness, okay, in the wisdom of God, Standing in our identity, okay? This gives us understanding of who we are in Christ. And it's in the truth. It also gives us protection, okay? 
protects us from deceit. And this is what I really want to get into today a little bit more about protection and deception and why knowing the word is so critical at this time. Okay, now when Jesus was talking to his disciples about the coming times, okay, he was talking to his followers. They were asking him about it. And he talks about the times of the end. And he says, okay, this is Mark and Matthew. He said, see that no one leads you astray. In Matthew chapter 24, he says it four times. Okay, repetition is for emphasis, right? This is really important. He also talks about being deceived. He says, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Okay, this is all about even the times we're in, okay? Peter also warns the followers about this. 2 Peter 2.1, he says, this is talking first about in the past, but then he goes into the future. He says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. That's the way of the Lord. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. And we see Paul speaking to Timothy on the same thing. There's uh, quite a few scriptures on that. Now, one thing to note is he's talking to the body, right? So these false teachings, these false prophecies, they're going to come from within. And that's part of the reason these are going to be deceitful. Okay, because it's from a source, we don't expect it. We expect it from the world, but we don't expect it from within the body. And this is also clear in Proverbs. Okay? Um, and in Proverbs, it talks about what is our defense against this deceit. Okay? And this isn't rocket science, right? We, know to know, we need to know what the Word says for ourselves. We need to know, we need to get it in our heart so we can recognize the falsehood and the counterfeit. And I'm sure you've heard this before, um, and I did look it up, because apparently it is true, that when they used to teach people about counterfeit money, they'd first show them the genuine thing, get them to look at it, see what it looks like, see what it feels like, so when they pick up something false, they would recognize it right away. And that's how we're to do it. When we pick up the genuine, we get to know the truth, the genuine, so when we hear something false, there's something that clicks in us saying, hmm, there's something that may not be right about this. Okay? So, in Proverbs. Okay, this is 2, 1 to 5, and verses 10 to 12. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Okay, so here's the condition. If you receive my words and my commandments. This is the first condition, okay? Okay. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, okay, these are the conditions. You've got to want it, okay? You've got to search it out. It's not a passive endeavor. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For wisdom will come into your heart, because you're pondering it, you're spending time in it, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. It's good to know the word. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. Delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech. Okay? From false prophets, from people who are speaking deceit, from speaking lies. Okay? It's stated very clearly. You have to start with the word. Okay? Knowing it, the word says here, leads to understanding, knowledge, wisdom, protection from evil and perverted speech. Okay? The word, the genuine, is a protection from the counterfeit. And I think we also have to get into what is the nature of deceit. And to do this, we're going to go to Genesis 3, and I know Marty talked about this last week, but it bears, um, I think it's good to take it and look at it again, and I think we're quite familiar with this. So you can turn to Genesis 3, I don't have a slide for that. Okay, and of course, you know, this is the serpent coming up to Eve. And I'm going to start in uh, verse, I guess it's verse 1. This is the serpent talking to the woman, to Eve. 
Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So we know how the serpent asks the question. He knows there's a seed of truth in that, right? We know there's a partial truth. But the way he asks it, he puts doubt. Right? There's a little kind of a tweak there. He puts doubt right away into the woman. And the woman responds. And she says, or Eve responds, and she says, oh, no, that's not right. You know, God did, well, God did say we can't eat of the trees, but then she hit, puts a man-made hedge around it, and you shall not touch it. She puts something of man into this, this response here. And then the, resp the serpent responds. He says, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Well, what a big lie that was. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is, a, this is partly true, right? God does know that their eyes are going to be opened. So when the woman saw, so the woman took her eyes off of God, that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, okay, she looked at all the good things that she thought looking at the tree. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate, and the eyes of both were opened. So we see here, and we know what happened after that, right? So we see that deceit, one of the natures of deceit is partial truths, okay? That can draw you in because, well, that's partly true. Yeah, I think that might be all true. No, we have to test it. We have to test it all. We have to beware of mixture. So we have to think, are we accepting a whole statement because of a partial truth? Okay, we've got to look at this stuff. And there are everyday things we hear, or we've heard since childhood. But we just accept them because they've always been around. They've always been there. And we've never really considered their validity. This is within the church, but it's also without. Because we've never tested these things. We just accept them. And I'm going to give you a simple example. Okay? Has anyone ever said to you, God helps those who help themselves? Everybody, anybody heard that before? Okay. Now, where is that in the Bible? Thank the call. Coffee's ready. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, is it in the Bible? This is a trick question here. It's not in the Bible. Okay, it's Aesop's Fables. Okay, and I'm sure a lot of people have actually probably read some of them. There are some very good morals in Aesop's Fables, but it doesn't mean they're true for the children of God. Some of them are, but some of them may not be. So let's test this. Okay, let's test this. Does God expect us to help ourselves before He helps us? So I'm just going to do it really quickly here. Okay, we're going to go to Psalm 34, 17. When the righteous cry for help, we're righteous, right? We're righteous in Jesus. The Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Okay, it doesn't say that, you know, we've got to go help ourselves first, and then he'll just come along and say, okay, you've done enough, I'll help you now. What about Matthew 6:33? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. When we're in need, okay, he says what we're supposed to do is not go and help ourselves first. We're supposed to go to him first. So this Aesop fable, this moral, it's not really true for us, is it? He doesn't want us to go off on our own and try to solve our problems without going to him first. We are not to try to earn his help. We're not to try and be independent of him. Okay, this is why we need to test things. And deceit can be very subtle, okay? And um, it can be hidden in the use of the word of God. And I'm going to show you an example of how this could work. We've all heard this before. James 4, 7, B, says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So, this is, if this is true, then we should just, when the, we feel we're spiritually attacked, all we have to do is stand up to the enemy, and he's going to flee. However, you've got to read a little bit more. So let's see the little bit more of this. Now, the context of this in James 
is worldliness versus godliness. Okay, James is talking about it. If we go back, we see, and James uh, is talking, he says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So if you read this whole thing, you see, if you're approaching, if your heart is in rebellion, you're not submitted to God, and then you go and resist the devil, you're not really going to get anywhere because there's conditions here. You have to be humble. You have to be submitted to God. So this is about um, how deceit can work within the Word of God. We have to understand the context of the Word. Okay? And we know Jesus went through the same thing, right? When he was in the wilderness, the 40 days, and the, and the devil came to tempt him, the devil used the Word of God against him. He tried to. But Jesus, of course, saw through this, okay? And he used the Word back. He used the sword of the Spirit. You know in, our, um, in Ephesians, it talks about all the armor of God. We put all this armor on, and we have one weapon, and that's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. But we have to rightly use it. And that's partly looking at the context of the word. Now, context is not just looking at what comes before and after. There's more to context, but we don't have to get into this right now. So, how are we to approach reading the word and getting to know what it says? Now, this seems like a little bit of a no-brainer, but we do have to ask it. So, when you want to learn and study the word, what is your first go-to source? Ideally, it should be the word, right? Right? You want to learn about it? Let's go to the Word itself. And I have to say, I have to bring this up because some people will go to teachings first. And it may be to a very reputable teacher. And then they're even going to look up the scriptures that are given. Teachings can be an extremely good source, but they should not be your first go-to. Okay? Teachings, they can feed us but they don't necessarily teach us to feed ourselves. We have to go to the Lord first, to his word first. Read, ponder, ask the Lord, what do you mean by this? Open my ears to hear you. Open my heart to receive your word. And Jesus says in John 14, 25, speaking to his disciples and his followers, he says, these things I've spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring them to your remembrance, all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit is going to teach us. So pray for revelation when you go into the Word. Read it. And ideally, teachings should be support what you have already read for yourself and pondered and talked with God about. So when you hear a teaching, don't just take it as truth right away. Be like the Bereans. In Acts 17, uh, 10 to 11, this is during Paul's missionary journeys, and he's going to all the different churches or all the different communities, and he's preaching the gospel. And this is when he goes to Berea. He says, the, the word says, Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed. They received the teaching with eagerness. They want to learn, but they went to the word of God to verify, to test these words. Now, this is really important for teachings because there's a lot out there now. We can get access to all sorts of things on the internet. And some of these things are like, wow, this is really amazing, and you really want to believe it. But you have to still test it. And you have to be careful of teachings that are built around one single scripture with no other substantiation. And there's things we want to believe because they're just so, wow, this would be really cool if all these things connected. But if you can't substantiate clearly in the word, you have to put it on a shelf till you can do so. So be careful of what you're watching. Remember to test it. They can be right on, but you you still have to look at it. You have to be like the Bereans. In Hebrews 6, the Lord wants us, he says, the Lord wants us to be mature in the faith. It says, to be skilled in the word of righteousness. We always, we'd often talk about being fed. Are we being fed? Are we being fed? But that's not what maturity is. It's learning to feed ourselves. And this can happen if we don't read the word. And there's different ways of approaching the word. 
So what I advocate doing, no matter how else you're studying or meditating on the Word, is to have a regular Bible reading plan to make sure you go through the whole Bible every year. And every year you can pick a different translation. Okay, it helps reveal different things to you. We think differently. Some are right brain, some are left brain, and some translations will speak more to us than other ones. If you do this, you'll start to see the cycles of God, the patterns, consistent messages, and you'll also have a greater revelation of how his whole plan of redemption comes together. And also, uh, you'll have this internal library that the Holy Spirit can draw on. You know, we talk about how he brings to remembrance that Jesus was talking to his followers about the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance when we need the words. You have to have that internal library. Now, there's different plans out there if you want to do this. There's a one-year Bible. I'm sure some of you have used that before. It's a one, you can get the Bible at the bookstore, and it just goes all the way through. It's divided all up for you. In that little daily bread devotional, I'm sure some of you have it, at the bottom, they have scriptures so you can go through the Bible in a whole year. And I have one that I've been following that I like. I, don't have a co I have some copies that I brought. It's more chronological. It's the way I, th I think more. And um, it'll take you through. It's a five-day-a-week plan. So if you can't quite get through it all, you have two days of grace to get through it. And you can take it off as you go. I'm going to put... Now, if anybody wants a copy, maybe you haven't done a Bible reading plan before, or maybe you've done one and you're kind of tired, you'd like to have something different, I'm going to put a bunch of copies on the welcome desk, so you're free to pick one up for yourselves. So, let's encourage each other to read the Word of God regularly, consistently, to get to know it like your best friend. All right? You know what, you're your best friend, you want to be with them a lot, right? You want to take time with them. And to recognize, in this way, to recognize God's work in our lives, to recognize his plans, to recognize who he is, to know the counterfeit from the truth, and also more, more than anything else, it's just to get to know him better. So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word, what you gave us. Lord, we know this must be important to you. Lord, I just pray that you will help us to um, give us that that renewed hunger for your word, to know you, Lord God, to open our hearts and our spiritual eyes and ears to hear and to see the revelation in your word. And I pray for those who have very busy lives with full-time work, Lord, with families, Father, that you will open up a window of time for them if their desire is to read, Lord, that you will open up that window of time for them so they can do this, Lord God. And I just thank you, Lord, for the revelation you're going to give us more and more. We thank you, Lord, that you want to do this for our own protection. We thank you, Lord, that you have um, a blessings to give us, Lord, as we walk in your ways, as we ponder on your word, as we learn who you are. So we just give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.